If you know the book of Esther, you probably already know the title of my message because it's been preached many, many times in many different places. You've heard it quoted, at least this one verse of Scripture, many, many times, for such a time as this. For such a time as this. The Jews just recently celebrated Purim, which is a commemoration of the deliverance of God's people from the king of Persia. If you know the story, Haman was made the prime minister, and he plotted to have all the Jews put to death. And Queen Esther, and her Hebrew name is Hadassah, Hadassah was instrumental in their deliverance. I'll try and give you a brief synopsis of the book of Esther without reading all ten chapters. But the Jews were taken captive, taken prisoner, and they were held in Persia under the king of Persia for their disobedience to God, the rejection of God into idolatry, and so as God had often done, he put them in subjection to the people of Persia. There is a man named Haman who is an egotist, and uh, the king makes him the second in command of all the, all the kingdom of Persia. And so when Haman comes into town, everyone is to bow down before Haman and to give him the honor, and he eats it up. He loves it. He's an egotist. He's, a, he's, a, he's a arrogant. Well, Mordecai is a Hebrew. Mordecai is a Jew. Mordecai knew that I'm not to bow down to any god but Jehovah God. And so as Haman came into town with his entourage, Mordecai stood there. Everybody else bowed down. Mordecai would not. Haman said, I hate this guy. I don't like this guy, Mordecai. And so he plotted and schemed to have Mordecai put to death. And by the way, Mordecai was a Jew. You know what? I'll have all his people, all these people in, his, in, in, uh, in Persia, all these Jews, I'll have them all put to death because of Mordecai, because he won't bow down to me. Did I tell you he was an egotist? Well, as the king goes through his records, he sees that, uh, that there was one person in his kingdom who actually saved his life. And uh, his name was Mordecai. And so he said, what, what, did we, what did I ever do to reward Mordecai? Did, did, you know, he calls in his servants. What did we ever do for Mordecai? Well, nothing, king. We did nothing. He says, well, you know what? Mordecai saved my life. I, I think he's... Uh, you know what I'll do? I'll call in Haman. Haman! Um, what would you do if you really wanted to honor somebody who, who deserved honor? Now, Haman, being the egotist that he was, thought that the king was speaking of him. And so he begins to wax eloquent. Well, king, what I would do for the man that you were going to honor, and he starts to basically write his own, uh, his own blessings, his own list of things that he wanted. I would give him great honor and I would reward him. And, and so the king says, wonderful, Haman, thank you so much. Now I want you to go and do that for Mordecai. <laughs> now Mordecai is, uh, now Haman is just beside himself with anger and rage. You know, Mordecai, the one I hate the most. And so he plots and he schemes this plan to have all the, all the people, all the Jews, uh, put to death. And so he presents it to the king, and the king says, Haman, uh, you're, you're, whatever you want. And he says, okay. And so he puts this plan in place to have all the Jews put to death. Well, it happens in the, in the uh, period, in the sequence of time, uh, there, that, there, that, he, that the king had a queen. You still with me? The king had a queen, and uh, he, he gave a feast for all his friends, as kings do, and he, and he said, and he wanted to show off his beautiful queen. And so he called for her. I want you to come and I want you to show your beauty to all my friends. Well, the queen was a woman, I, you know, it doesn't say much about her, but she was a class act. This was a classy lady, I have to say, because she said, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to come and be your trophy. I'm not going to come and show myself before all your friends. And she refused to come. Well, you just don't do that in Persia. You just don't do that to the king of Persia. So the king of Persia calls for her and says, you know what? Give me back your crown. You're not queen anymore. And by the way, I'm sending you packing. And so he sends the queen away. Now he needs another queen. 
And so the king calls, he, he walks, looks around, you know, and he spots this one beautiful woman of, of the Jewish people, Hadassah, Esther. And he says, I, and he calls her to be his queen. So now, now, now he, Esther or Hadassah is his new queen and she's beautiful. And um, it just so happens that Esther is Mordecai's niece. So Mordecai goes to Esther and says, Esther, it's up to you, girl. You're the queen. You're in this place of, of, of prominence. You're in this place of influence. And, and Haman has already determined to destroy all the Jews. All of our people will be put to death. Esther, it, it falls upon you. It, it may very well be in your hands. And how do you know that perhaps you've not come to the kingdom for such a time as this? So you have the story now that we're going to talk about. In uh, chapter 9, verse 28, it says, And these days, uh, and this is, this is after the fact, this is, this is what Mordecai says, And that these days should be remembered and kept throughout every generation, every family, every province, and every city, and that these days of Purim should not fail from among the Jews, nor the memorial of them perish from their seed. And so the Jews keep this feast of Purim from all the way back from this story in the book of Esther. Now I'm not speaking on this subject today because of the Jewish celebration of Purim. Because if so, I'm a day late and a dollar short. Because that was a couple of weeks ago. Purim was celebrated. I'm not, I'm not speaking on this subject. To be honest with you, it had absolutely nothing to do with the fact that the Jews just celebrated Purim. I just came to realize, and I was thinking about the times in which we live. I was thinking about the, the, the calling of God and the purpose of God in my life and in your life and in our lives. And so I just determined, I believe that this is the message that God has for us today. Forget that Purim was just a couple of weeks ago. This is a message for First Assembly of God this morning. As I said last week regarding the Song of Solomon, some of the higher critics look at the Song of Solomon. Remember I spoke on that last week. The, the Song of Solomon, higher critics say that should not be con contained in, in the scriptures. It really shouldn't be part of the canon. It really shouldn't be part of Holy Script because, um, because it, they see it as just an allegory, just an allegorical story. Or, as I said, erotic poetry, as a man wrote this, this beautiful loving poem to his bride. And they say, it should not be contained in Holy Script because it is, uh, it's just an allegory. But we have determined, as we said last week, the Holy Spirit saw fit to keep it there. And so there's a lot of things that we could learn and see from that book. Well, there are similar uh, accusations against the book of Esther. The higher critics say, this should not be contained in Holy Scripture because it doesn't, in ten chapters, doesn't mention God once. Imagine that, a book of the Bible, God's holy word, and it doesn't even mention him once. And so they say, well, this should not be involved in, in, in scripture because it doesn't mention God. But friends, you can see from, one, from, from the whole book, you could see the, the incredible providence of God as it's unfolded through the lives of these people. You see the providence of God. And so we believe that this is indeed scripture. And it is to be taught. And it is to be heard. And it's to, there's, there's a message here. Imagine, for just a moment, if we took Esther, just this, this Hadassah, this young Hebrew girl, and we just took her right out of the picture. Esther and the book doesn't belong in scripture, we're, we're just, it, it's just not there. It, it never happened, it's not important. Imagine, Haman would have been successful in annihilating the Jews, because Esther wasn't there to stop him. There would have been, because the Jewish nation was destroyed, there would have been no Jesus of Nazareth, no savior of the world, no Christian church, no born again experience, no eternal life. Just remove Esther from the whole picture and, and, and it all... It, do you follow me? Now I want you to note something. If you have your Bibles open to Esther, turn to chapter 4 and verse 14. <coughs> the 
Mordecai speaking to Esther when he says, you've got to, you got to step up. He says this, he said, for if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, now notice this, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this. In other words, Mordecai says to her, Esther, it's up to you. It's falling on you. You have the influence. You have the power. You're in the position to deliver the people of Israel from this king. But, he says, if you don't, God is going to make a way. Only you and your house are going to miss out. Do you hear me? This may, not, uh, this may be different than anything you've ever heard before. Maybe you've never heard this before, but I'm going to show you something, I believe, from Scripture that we need to understand. And this brings me to my first point. The sovereignty of God. Church, for the next few weeks, in the Sunday night services at least, maybe in the Sunday morning, I don't know how God leads us, but we're going to get a bigger picture of God. He doesn't fit in your box. Like I've said before many times, whenever we start to say God is like, you know, God is like. No, he's, anything you say God is like, anything you say after that, you're completely and absolutely wrong. Because God is like nothing. Amen. He's like nothing you have ever seen, heard, or can even imagine. God is not altogether different than anything you could ever comprehend. But we, we put him in our little box so that we can understand him and, and somewhat control him. Well, we're going to blow that box apart. Because God don't fit no box. I don't want to talk about the sovereignty of God. When you look at this world, then and now, imagine the world was spinning out of control. The, true, the children of Israel, this nation of Israel, these people of God, were taken captive. And now they're held under the power of the Persian king. And they are his slaves to do as he will with. And now, beside being held slaves to this man, it seems as though we're all going to be put to death. There's a death sentence upon every last one of us. The world is spinning out of control. And there's nobody here to help us. Could you get the picture back then? And sometimes we look at the world today and we say it's spinning out of control. Amen. The world is in, it's falling into chaos. I mean, the whole world is just nuts. And there's nobody. You look at the economy, the world's economy is all tied together and they're all, it's just going crazy. And religious, uh, not religious, but national leaders uh, people, kings and, and, and dictators and the like who have been in control of nations for years, they're being taken down through coups and, and uprisings of militaries and you know, leaders fall. It's just an absolute disaster. It's just a mess. And you, and you look at the whole thing and you say, what is going on? The world is in chaos. Not only that, but earthquakes and, and tsunamis and tornadoes and hurricanes. and uh, Man, it's just... It's going completely rioting in the streets around the world. It, hey, man, it's a real nail biter. How's this going to end? What's going to happen? No. No. Friends, you need to understand this that God is still very much in control. Amen. 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 Give Him the glory. He holds the whole world in his hands. Want to sing? I won't. He's got the whole world in his hands. Never once was his plan uh, 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 in question. Never once was his authority uh, in jeopardy. Never once was his eternal plan ever held in question. Listen to what Daniel the prophet says in Daniel chapter 4 verse 35. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And he, God, 
doeth according to his will in the army of heaven. And among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? God in the armies of heaven is in total and absolute control and nobody could stop him and nobody could say, what are you doing? <laughs> but we put our hands on our hips and say, God, I don't understand. What? You need to tell me. <laughs> oh, really? If God tried to explain to you in terms that are common to him, you, your puny little brain would pop and splatter the walls. You couldn't comprehend. We are, we are finite beings. He's an infinite God. Let me, I'm going to show you something tonight. Um, every one of you come back. <laughs> I'm going to show you something tonight. I've sh we, we've seen it before, but you, you got to see it. It will blow your mind when you look at the magnitude of God. And, and you know, and, uh, do you see that dot on the wall? That little pen dot. I, I ran back there this morning and put a little pen dot. You see that dot? Yeah, you see it, right. <laughs> if, if there was a dot, it's far too small for you to see sitting back there, that dot. But that dot represents earth. And there, and there's seven billion of us. You, you just represent one of the seven billion specks of dust floating around on that little speck of dust in God's vast universe. And we stand back and say, but you better, I don't understand. Doesn't make sense to me. Friend, the fact that you don't understand don't mean nothing. You can't understand the infinite power and majesty and mind of God. Listen, nations rise and fall at his discretion. He raises them up and he brings them down at his discretion. But Paul said it this way in Romans 13.1, The powers that be are ordained of God. I've said it before, I'll say it again. Listen, we talk about elections and you vote. And when you vote, let, let me tell you, God help me. You vote according to God's word. God don't want us killing babies. Okay? God don't want us marrying uh, uh, the same sex. Don't want it. It's there in scripture. Okay? Whatever else, whatever else people are running on, you vote what God's word says. And God will take care of the rest. He said, seek ye first my kingdom, kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added unto you. You take care of that first. God will take care of everything else. Here's the problem. As the Jews would turn against God every time, Every time God would raise up for them ungodly, evil kings, right, and false prophets. And whenever they would turn back to God in repentance and cry out to him, he would raise up a godly king and godly prophets. What part, what, what part are we in? What stage of the game do you think we are in as a nation with the things that we're doing. I'm just saying, we get what we deserve. The powers that be are ordained of God. He raises up nations and he takes them down. God is in absolute control of everything that is happening on his planet. Amen. Just because you don't understand doesn't mean anything. Let me just say this. I don't mean to offend you, but I think you think much too highly of yourself. When, when you think you need to understand God or he needs to make himself clear to you. I think you think far too highly of yourself. Do you really think you could be God's advisor? Do you really think you could sit him down and tell him something that he doesn't know? Listen, but, but that's, so, that's so human of us. God's eternal plan is never in question. Listen, from the foundation of the world, the Lamb of God was slain. We sang this morning of the Lamb of God. 
from the foundation of the world, before the worlds existed, before that dot called earth and all the other dots in, the, in, in God's vast universe, before he even brought, spoke those into existence, the Lamb of God in the plan of God was already slain. Do you get this? Calvary was not an afterthought. The cross was not plan B. It was plan A all along. God doesn't have a plan B. The eternal plan of God from the foundation of the world was well established and it is being unfolded even as we speak. God told Noah, uh, uh, Adam and Eve in the garden, G Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, he said that there would be a deliverer, there would be a redeemer. He told Noah there would be a redeemer. He told Abraham there would be a redeemer. Through the prophets, throughout the ages, he promised a redeemer. He said to the prophets, there would be born of a virgin in Bethlehem, named uh, Yahshua, Jesus, who would save the world from their sin. It was, and the Bible told us that he would die upon a cross and that he would rise from the grave. And he, Do you understand? God's plan from all eternity, it has never changed. It has never faltered. It was never altered. There was never a question in, in anybody's mind if it was going to come to pass. Do you get the picture? Amen. So who is Haman that he could possibly thwart the plan of eternal God? Get the picture? Now, Hadassah, Esther, was chosen by God to be a part of his eternal plan. Don't answer this out loud because I don't want anybody to be embarrassed. God called Esther to be the person that he would use to bring about the redemption of his people, the rescue of his people. Did Esther have a choice? Don't answer out loud. Did Esther have a choice? She absolutely had a choice. She absolutely had a choice. When Mary, the mother of Jesus, was called by God, and the angel came and said, Blessed art thou amongst women, and uh, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna conceive of the Holy Spirit, and you're going to bring forth... Uh, uh, the, the man child, his name is going to be Jesus. He's going to save the world from, this, from their sin. Did Mary have a choice? She absolutely had a choice. In fact, she said to the angel, Be it unto me according to thy word. Be it. In other words, she, yes, I am in agreement. Yes, Lord, I will. Yes, I will. Friends, understand this. God's, would, and then would God's plan be hindered? If Esther said no, I'm not going to the king. If Mary said, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to face this, uh, the possible shame of being uh, pregnant out of wedlock. No, I'm not going to do it. Would God's plan have been, ha have been thwarted? Would God's plan have come to an end? No. Because he had promised that, that he would bring forth a redeemer. Now God in his foreknowledge knew these things would happen. My point is, God is sovereign. He is over all. His plan is never held into question. But if it had been that Esther said no, then her house would have fallen. And she would never have been blessed as she was. You still with me? Mm -hmm. Keeping this in mind, my second point. We are called for a purpose. For Esther, the deliverance of the Jewish nation. For Esther, she was called to be the vessel that God chose to bring about the deliverance of the nation of Israel. And she stepped forward and she fulfilled her calling just as God had planned and just as God knew she would. And she, stepped, and she was used mightily of God. For you and for me, we must discern his will for us. We have to discover and find out, God, what is it that you want me to do? What is my purpose in this life? What is my purpose in, in this church? What is my purpose in Christianity? What have you called me for? Listen, Jesus taught us to pray. By the way, it's a daily prayer. When the disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray. And Jesus said, pray in this manner. He didn't say, repeat after me. He didn't say, write this down and recite it ten times. 
He said, repeat, he said, uh, uh, in this manner, pray in this manner. In other words, like this. He was teaching them how to pray. Pray like this. And the elements of that prayer we know as, uh, as the Lord's Prayer, but the elements of the prayer is what he was teaching to pray. Pray like this. God is to be hallowed. You know, we're to pray for deliverance. We're to pray for our daily bread. This is a daily prayer. And then we're to ask, Lord, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Listen to that. Your will done on earth as it is done in heaven. God's will is done in heaven. The plan, the eternal plan of God is well established in heaven. Do you realize that? When we pray, we're not altering God's plan. We're altering ourselves to fit God's plan. So, Lord... Let me find your will today. Help me to come under your will. Help me, Lord, to be obedient. Show me what you want me to do. That's the essence of the prayer. Lord, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Help me to know what your will is and to carry out your will. Help me to discern your voice and your direction for me this day. If you don't, heaven's not at a loss. Are you with me? If you don't, heaven is not at a loss. Heaven doesn't say, oh, no, what do I do now? I was really counting on you. What do I do now? No! God's not at a loss. God's plan is not at a loss. Never once is it called into question. The universe does not come to an abrupt halt simply because you didn't do what God wanted you to do. God's will rolls on. So who will God use to fulfill his will? Surely he'll use a David, a mighty king. David, Saul has killed his thousands. David is ten thousands. Surely God will use a man like David and call him forth indeed. God will use a Paul, formerly Saul of Tarsus, a Pharisee of Pharisees, gifted and talented and well-educated. Surely God will use a Saul of Tarsus, yeah, God will. He, he will indeed, and he, and he did. God will use a Martin Luther, a Martin Luther who stood and said, here's where I stand. I could do no other. God, help me. I can't, I can't compromise the, the, the truth of God's word, not for anything. God used a Martin Luther. Yes, he'll use a Martin Luther. Sure he will. He did. How about an orphaned Jewish slave named Hadassah or Esther? A little Jewish slave. Slave who was orphaned. How about a bunch of fishermen? Will God use a bunch of fishermen? How about a mailman? That's where I was when God called me. That's what I was doing. How about a machinist? How about a hairdresser? How about a housewife? Listen, friends. This is what impresses me the most. When God brought forth his church, he used what seemed... Uh, w that some would deem unlikely candidates. He didn't look, he didn't come, notice he didn't call King Herod the king of the day when, when he brought forth the Messiah. He didn't call the king. He didn't call for the religious leaders. He didn't call for the rich and powerful and mighty of Jerusalem. No, he called fishermen and a, and a tax collector and an ex-Pharisee. He called those unlikely people. And it wasn't in their education. What does fishing have to do with being a disciple of Christ? Amen. And what does, what does being a, a, a Pharisee have to do? It wasn't their education. It wasn't their abilities. It wasn't the, what it was was their willingness to serve God. Amen. Their willingness Amen. to surrender to him to say, Lord, use me right where I am. God, just take me and use me. It was their willingness. It was in the power of God, His anointing, His Holy Spirit working through them that they accomplished what they accomplished. Friends, He has called and used people, regular people, down through the ages. You say, I'm no Esther. I'm no Paul. I'm no Peter. Indeed. Indeed. Esther was an orph orphaned slave right where she was. God didn't look for somebody and say, well, I need to bring somebody 
I need to bring somebody in to accomplish my task here. I need to find somebody that I could bring into Israel, into Persia. And, and No, she was right there. She, in her daily life, a, a slave girl, an orphan, right there in the midst of the... And God used her right where she was. She was just willing to be used. <clears throat> Great miracles were done at the hands of the apostles, fishermen, and the like. Great miracles done at the hands of the apostles. <clears throat> but friends, <clears throat> excuse me, miracles continued to be done by those who believed. The canon of Scripture, the Bible, is a closed book. It's a closed canon, which means that there is nothing to follow. This is the complete revelation of God. This is the revelation that God wanted us to know. Nothing else. There's no new revelation, no new apostles, no new prophets getting a new word from God. Amen. If anybody says, I've got a word from God and it's not already written, it's a lie. There's no new revelation. This is it. So the canon of scripture is closed as to all the miracles, but it doesn't mean that miracles stopped. Just that they didn't need to be recorded anymore. That, that was the end. We know all we need to know from the word of God, but miracles continued and miracles continue today. Listen, Jesus said, These signs shall follow them that believe. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Mark 16, verses 17 and 18. These signs shall follow them that believe. Any believers here? And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, confirming the word with signs following. Amen. Mark 16, 20. So miracles still work, still, still happen. God still uses people. God is still calling people, still anointing people, still using people for his glory. And friends, we are the generation of today. That's not profound. We are the generation of today. We are the generation now. We're here, and if God is going to use anyone, he's going to use us. Because there's nobody else. We're here, and God's going to use us. People said, I, I went to college in, in uh, Louisiana, Bible college, and you don't know how many times I heard this. Where are you from? Well, they know where I'm from, my accent. Now, you don't think I have an accent, but if you were in Louisiana, you would think I had an accent. I say, where are you from? You're from New England, right? Yeah. Oh, oh, preacher's graveyard. I don't know how many times I heard that. New England's a preacher's graveyard. Good luck, man, going up there. Preacher's graveyard. Well, yeah, because there's mega churches down south, churches on every corner of the Bible Belt. In New England, yeah, yeah, things sometimes could be considered a little tougher. It was, you know, it's so hard to preach salvation up here. Well, so... Some have chosen to preach something else because salvation and repentance is a hard message to preach in New England. So others have chosen to preach something else. Oh, I'm sorry for them. But this is the word of God. And God still requires those who will faithfully carry out his will. Amen. Who will faithfully hold the word of God to be true, preach it, live it, and those who will obey him. He still looks for those who rely completely upon his empowering spirit. Amongst us. Amongst you, those who will be sold out for him. Amen. God is still calling Hadassahs, Esthers, right where you are. Those who will do the call, those who will be obedient to his calling. Finally, the risk and the reward. What did it cost Esther? What did it cost her? Well, what could it have cost her? The last queen didn't come out too good. When he called her and said, come show yourself to my friends, and the queen said no, she lost her crown and he sent her packing. Didn't work out too good for her. Now, to go into the king's presence, it was what, what Mordecai was asking Esther to do. To go into the king's presence when you weren't called by the king. You didn't just lose your crown and get sent packing, you could lose your life. According to the law of the Medes and Persians that couldn't be altered, 
If she went into the king's presence and the king didn't offer her his scepter, if he just was in a bad mood or just did not, he, she could die. And there was no reason to believe that this wouldn't happen. Think about it. Her predecessor, right? Didn't turn out so good. So she already knows how the king is and that he keeps the law and that he doesn't show a lot of grace or mercy. If he booted the last queen and the law says, I could die, she had every reason to believe that she might lose her life. And she, but she was, and she took this chance. Listen, maybe God didn't really want her to be so bold. Maybe God didn't want her to go in and talk to the king. I'm sure she considered that. After all, Mordecai said God's will would find another way. God's will will be done. She could have reasoned, whether I do or don't, so maybe I'll just leave it for somebody else, and I don't want to, I don't want to risk my life. It could have cost her her very life, but here's what she said. She said, if I perish, I perish. If I die, I die. If, if, if this is the end, I have to do this. I believe that this is what God wants me to do. It's, it's my time. Maybe I have been called to the kingdom for such a time as this. Maybe I'm here now because this is what God wants me to do. And if I die, I die. Look, church, we need to cast caution to the wind. Now, I'm not saying that we are to be presumptuous. I'm not just saying, well, do whatever you think you want to do and, you know, and God's going to bail you out. I'm not talking about presumption. But what has God impressed upon you? What do you see? What do you think is your purpose in life? What do you think God wants you to do? Don't say you're here just to warm a church a pew or to, you know, to, breathe, you know, to warm the air with your breath. You're not here just to take up space and, and, and to impact the carbon footprint of the world. You're, there's a purpose for you, and especially those who are children of God. You are saved. Christ has saved you. You are called for a purpose. And you're here now for such a time as this. What does God want you to do? Now, you can't just sit there and say, well, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't feel led or I don't. No, if God's called you, what do you feel God wants? What do you believe God wants you to do? What do you believe your purpose is? you got to cast caution to the wind and say, if I die, I die. If I fail, I fail, but I've got to do this for God. This is what I believe he wants me to do. And you step out like Esther did. When you believe that you've been called into the service of our God, there are times to step out in faith. I'm almost done. What was at stake? What was at stake for Hadassah? What was at stake Thousands, if not millions, of innocent Jews were to be slaughtered if she didn't step out. She had the potential, but not guaranteed power to save them. She had the potential, but she didn't know. She just had to try that. She had to go forward. And what was the reward? First, she got to see the enemy destroyed. Because, let me go back to the story. Haman built gallows to have Mordecai put to death. To have Mordecai hanged on the gallows. And when, when this all fell out and the king realized through Esther what Haman meant to do, king had Haman hung on the gallows. You don't get to see that much, right? You don't always get to see your enemy's downfall. But, uh, but Esther did. She got to see her enemy destroyed. She got to, re to see all the Israels, her whole nation spared and saved. She got to receive the blessings that came to her. And Uncle Mordecai was now elevated to prime minister in Haman's place. And all the honor went to now Mordecai. She got to see all of this. It all turned out on her behalf. And she received the blessing. And by the way, she's written for all time and eternity in Holy Scripture. And we're talking about her today because she obeyed God. Amen. There was rewards that go with this. As I close, we could have been born in another era. We could have been born in another time. I think about it often. I, I always have growing up. We'll find that off button in just a second. <laughs> Throw it against the wall. <laughs> Pull out the battery. <laughs> or answer it. 
we'll all say hello. We could have been born in another time. I think about it. You know, could you imagine being born in biblical times? Could you imagine, could you imagine having walked with Jesus and seen the miracles? Could you imagine? Could you imagine have following the apostles, the disciples? Could you imagine seeing those things? The early church and the miracles that transpired. How about a hundred years ago? I read stories of a hundred years ago, the, the turn of the century and the rebirth of the Pentecostal church. I think of the Assemblies of God a hundred years ago coming into existence and, and the men and, God, men and women of God of faith and the Brush Arbor meetings. They had revival services that lasted for weeks. Hello? Weeks. People would go to work, they'd, come, they'd rush home to get to church. Or out in the field where they built a, a brush arbor, a, 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 a church out in the middle of the woods someplace. And people would flock to come. People were saved by the millions. Missionaries went, sent out around the world. Churches rising up and everywhere. People being healed and delivered. Friends, glorious times that happened. I would have loved to have been there. I would have loved to have been even, grown up even 50 years ago. When... When, the, when people were still relatively decent. You didn't lock your doors. And yes, there were problems. Yes, we were stupid as a nation and some of the foolish things we did. But, but by and large, there was, the gospel was still being preached and people were still going to church. And I think about all of those, those things. Faith was strong. Revival services, evangelism, and so forth. But God has a plan. And his plan, obviously, was not for me to grow up 2,000 years ago or 100 years ago or 50 years ago. His plan was for me to grow up right now and to be right here. And uh, the same for you. God's eternal plan. It is eternal plan. Before the world's existed, before he spoke the world into existence, in his eternal plan, you were sitting right where you are right now. God knew called for such a time as this. Now, in some ways, these are harder times than in times past. I mean, we have the technology. We have air conditioning. Some people wish we didn't. We have air conditioning. We have heat. Uh, we have lights. We have, you know, we have, we've got technology. And in, we have, and in many, many ways, life has gotten a lot easier. But, but, as, but as far as the gospel goes, it has, it has gotten hard. And the Bible told us that it would. Listen, Paul said that in the last days many would be departing from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. You, they don't, and they won't endure sound doctrine. People don't want to hear about Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection. They don't want to hear about that. They want to talk about you know, prosperity and, and getting and being blessed. And they don't want to hear about sin and repentance and, uh, and, and death and hell. They don't want to hear about those things. And, and, and so they run after teachers who will tell them what they want to hear. The Bible says that in the last days, they'll be lovers of self more than lovers of God. Their belly is their God. They serve their own belly. They serve their own self-interest. And, 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 and that's what you see. By and large, that's what you see. And so we know that things are difficult, and there would have been a much easier time to preach the gospel. But he also promised to be with us even to the end of this world. Now, this last thing I'm going to say, and then, and, just, and then we'll be done. Listen to this. In the Great Commission, he called his disciples, and he said, go into all the world, preach the gospel, make disciples, teach them, teach all nations. He said, uh, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. He said, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Who was he talking to? Well, he wasn't just talking to his disciples because he said, till the end of the world, I am with you. He was talking to his church. Lo, I am with you always to the end of the, this age, to the end of the world, he said. He's talking to us. He said, go and I will be with you. So he's promised that he will never leave us nor forsake us. He's told us to go and to make disciples. He told us to teach all nations. Listen, church, he believes and knows that you could do it. See, this is the thing that amazes me. 
When I stand back and say, oh, God, I'm not Paul. I'm not Peter. I'm not Martin Luther. I, I, I don't, how is this, how is any of this going to be accomplished? Because God believes in me. I just mean, I'm just telling you, God believes in you. If he didn't, he would have put somebody else in your seat. He would have caused somebody else to live in the kingdom for such a time as this. Amen. He would have used somebody else. But he said, no, you, in his eternal plan, you are here now for this very purpose, that he might use you in his kingdom for his eternal plan. <laughs> Amen. Praise him. He believes you could do it. He believes you could do it. He knows you could do it. He has entrusted his eternal kingdom to you. He's promised to equip us, not with knowledge, but with his spirit. But it requires those who will hear and believe and answer and follow. Would you bow your heads and pray with me as we close this service? Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, we give you, Lord, first all glory. We give you all praise and all honor. You said, Lord, where we gather in your name, there you are in the midst. And so, Lord, you are present with us this morning, and we worship you, and we glorify you, and we honor you, and we thank you, Master, for your eternal plan. Thank you, God, that you've not left us that you're here with us even today. Thank you for your word that you have given. Thank you for your spirit, God, that reveals your word. Now, Lord, I ask that your spirit would speak to every heart bowed in your presence. God, that this message, this word from heaven, would penetrate our hearts. That we would realize, Lord, that you are not calling someone else. You've called us. We are here by your divine plan for such a time as this. We know, Lord, that your eternal kingdom, your eternal plan will not be thwarted. No one could stop it. It will roll on. But, Lord, if we don't answer, we will miss out on the blessing of serving you. We will miss out on the reward that you have intended for us. So, God, I pray that every person here today would realize and understand that your calling, Father, is more, it has preeminence. Your calling, Lord, is, is more important than anything else. Help us each, Lord, to realize our purpose in this time, in these days. And Lord, help us to answer that we might be the vessels that you use for your eternal plan. And the blessings will follow. Lord, I pray for everyone that's bowed in your presence today. God, I pray that, only, that you would speak in, in ways that only you could speak, Father God. That you would reveal your will to us. Lord, help us to be hungry for your will. Help us to desire your will, Lord God, more than anything else. We have plans, and we make plans, Lord, and, and we desire so many things, but God, help us to realize that your plan trumps all other plans. Help us to realize that we have been called to your kingdom for such a time as this, and help us, Lord, to say, if I perish, I perish, but I will do the will of the Lord. Father, I ask that as we leave this place today, this message would echo in our hearts. Let this message, Lord, be the topic of conversation at the lunch table. Let this conversation, let this message be what, what we go to bed with tonight thinking about. Let it be what we awaken to tomorrow, Lord, as we plan to serve you. God, as the fruit comes and as the answers come, we will give you all the glory and all the honor. For all of these things, Lord, we ask in the name above all names. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 amen.